So my name is Rim Abu Kaddour. I work at the research station over there. I think over there, <laughs> direction right. I'm plant pathologist. So uh, I am invited to talk about the history of plant disease. But uh, before I start the history, I want to talk about the most important diseases, how to manage them. And then we can jump to history when we have a bit of time. Uh, I work on uh, stripe rust and leaf spots. So I'm going to start talking about stripe rust. You guys, uh, any of you deal with wheat or wheat diseases? So do you know what is stripe rust? Yeah. All right. So you have seen then the symptoms of it, right? The people before you took my sample. <laughs> there. So these are uh, infected leaf to different degree with the stripe rust. Uh, you can pass it around. And this is the living sample of stripe rust. And from the name of it, stripe rust, it formed this uh, uh, pustule along the leaf vine in stripes. And that's why it gets its name. Or sometimes we call it yellow rust because it has the yellow uh, color. You guys are interested in living plants? If you pass your hands over the infected area, you get that yellow orange color into your fingers. You know that it is rust. So it's very uh, devastating disease. Uh, it's very explosive in nature. All rust are the same way. As soon as you get your lower canopy infected, uh, you might want to prepare to protect your upper canopy, but you might want to slow that down by spraying fungicide, but the best advice actually to, to grow resistance cultivar, we have resistance in our wheat, so select resistance variety and that's about the management. I'm not gonna expand much because I wanna jump into the history stuff, so if you want to have any question, you can ask me after. The other disease I like to talk about is leaf spots. I work on leaf spots quite a lot, and it's not easy to distinguish leaf spots because there are spots on the leaf and there are so many things that cause spots on the leaf. Some of it pathogen, some of it physiological. How could you distinguish that? Uh, really hard, but I can give you some hint or advices to do so. Uh, basically, from pathology point of view or disease, we have three pathogens that causes leaf spots. So we have the tan spot, which is most important, I uh, believe, in Alberta and West Canada. Then we have the Stagona spora, Nodorum, which rank number two. Septoria triticae, number three, is maybe probably more important to the east than to the west because it's like the humidity and a bit of cool. Tan spot, I work on that for 10 years. And if you give me a leaf with symptoms and tell me that it's tan spot, I cannot tell you for sure. However, I use certain criteria to judge. So this is for sure tan spot because I infected them. <laughs> <laughs> the lesion take the shape of uh, oval. It has a chlorotic margin. And in the center, there is the dark spot that is the, where the fungus penetrates. Uh, tan spot, the tan color, because it causes necrosis. So it gives that tan necrotic color. Uh, with the advanced progression of the disease, you have the whole leaf kind of necrotic and die. Uh, septoria, uh, I have a sample of that. Uh, it's more of longitude lesion. And then if you are young enough, you might not need to see that, but you can see the Bicnidia spore. And that when you realize you are not young enough and you need to use this. Is there is a, and let me see, I try to see that in the first slide. Yeah, I see it now. And <laughs> yes, that's fine. So do stand and this is the only septoria. Now, uh, management advice for uh, leaf spots. Those are uh, wheat uh, like on stubble born. So if you know that you have History with it, you might want to change your rotation. Don't grow cereal over cereal. Uh, 
you want to protect your upper canopy in any disease because your flag leaf and the ear contribute to 60% of your yield. Uh, with tan spot, you don't want to be as much alert as with rust because it's a little bit slower. So maybe you can get by with just protecting the flag leaf, but uh, unless you have a really a bad scenario. Uh, what other recommendation there? That's basically it. And if you have resistance, cultivar always try to consult to that. Now uh, I'm gonna jump to a bit of the history and I'm gonna talk about other diseases that we kind of consider is not a big deal anymore. However, we still consider it as one of the priority diseases and we breed for it for resistance for it every year. We have nursery with thousands of lines to screen resistance for this other disease. And I'm gonna play the guessing name. You might know it, I know, so I'm not gonna ask you. Okay. Do you know what is that? You can squish. This is other sample. squish the thing what you would find try to give me diagnosis try to describe it that's what is it okay so just squish it here here squish this what do you see simple spores? black powder that's what oh, I yes. see. Yeah, it's <laughs> spores. <laughs> it's not gunpowder. Like <laughs> no. So, why I give it to you? You are in the farming smarter. <laughs> huh. Yeah, okay. Now, this is common bunt or smut. This is one of the most ancient diseases with rust. People recognize this long times. They have it in even in holy books like Bible, where they didn't say it's bunt, but they describe plant being scalded, uh, plastered, uh, and later on, in around 1800s, they talk about mildew, which meant most likely rust or bunt. Uh, with agriculture in Canada, do you know when wheat start? When we started growing wheat? Any guess? No, in Canada. in Canada, in Canada. Okay, the first grain seed to be sown in this country was somewhere near what is today known as the Roche Cab in Quebec in 1541. It was either winter wheat or fall rye. And there was, I think, a trouble with the native people that whoever sown the, that grain left the site, but there was a record of having harvest over there. It took about almost 100 years to report on, uh, I think it took more than 100 year or 200 years to report, no, 100 years to report on the first disease, which was most likely drought somewhere in the east. And then other 100 years to report on the first disease, which was described as mildew, which most likely at that time referred to rust, most likely stem rust as well. So in the West, do you know when wheat started to grow? No, earlier. Well, have you heard about Sklirk settlement in Manitoba in the early 1800s? Lord Sklirk, who was like a new settler, got that land with the Hudson Bay and they started to grow wheat. I have also some image of old threshing crew. It was in the 1800s though? Yeah, 1800. And you can share the... Bunt uh, was more problem in the early 1800s, especially in the east where wheat started first and uh, people were not sure of what is causing it whatever but they were able to realize that it was on the seed born on the seed so there was a lot of uh, recommendation to treat it uh, like soaking the seed with salt water 
urine cattle. Later on in the 1850, there was more of uh, serious, more experimental to that. And they started to rec recommend the bluestone, which was the copper sulfate. And actually, in the around 1850, in the East, they used to sell something called the smatter, and you will find it only in, in the museum, like I found this photo. And the smatter is a little of machine uh, based on rotation. It can separate and speed. It can separate your smutted grain from the healthy one. And usually they will, people will get it, put it in their uh, mills somewhere, and they use it to get rid of the smut. And uh, sometimes uh, it was selling actually at that time around $50. So it would cause fire at some times because the high speed with the spores ignite fires. So this is an image of that smutter. And this is another uh, with experimental farm in the late 1800 and the early 1900. They moved from the recommendation of the soaking with the blue stone or the copper sulfate uh, to the formalin. And then later on, around 1950, you have the synthet like the uh, fungicide and stuff like that. So there is a long history of seed treatment. Bunt, I, I will, sorry, you did that. Bunt is one of these diseases that, you know, we consider it old, ancient, because we found the treatment for it. We breed for resistance for it, which is very important, especially when you have organic farming, because Otherwise, if you don't treat your seed, you don't have resistance, this is not an ancient disease anymore. It can cause trouble. <laughs> I mean, if you go survey, you might still not find it as often, but you might still find it. So it's there. Hopefully we can not have it. So this is just a, actually one interesting thing. I found this sample in the 1950. I didn't touch it. I just found it in my lab. And it's, uh, again, bunt. You have other type of, uh, of also the smut, the loose smut. So the one I show you, the covered smut, there is other fungus which cause these symptoms. This actually, I found this morning one sample of it in our nursery because we don't treat seeds. And it's also seed born. So these pathogens, ancient and could be very much recent. Uh, now the other pathogen, like the other kind of history, interesting to talk about pathology, uh, is uh, rust. Stem rust has very interesting history. In ancient civilization, there was a god for that thing. People thought that rust is punishment from God, so they have worshipped the Robigos the Roman god, people sacrifice red fox sheep for the rust cup to keep, to keep rust god happy. And they celebrate it on April 25. So that's something else. No, they are two different pathogens, but they are both ancient. And we were talking about the history of diseases today, so, but yeah. Now, there is something interesting I didn't mention to the first uh, crew about stripe rust in particular. You know, stripe rust is not a new problem, even though it's become more of economic damage to, to us, in, especially in the last uh, 15 years. However, people has known about it long way before that, but what they know about it also, it over winter, there is, uh, the first report of it over winter in Alberta in 1928. So uh, this was uh, taken from uh, a manuscript where they talk about, they show a map where they found this uh, stripe rust and evidence of it overwintering in uh, Claire's home. Yeah. So, yeah, and people, so don't be surprised that, yeah, it has been overwintering a long time. The other interesting aspects of rust, I guess, uh, especially in terms of history, 
is to talk about uh, stem rust and the I find that interesting to talk about the eradication of common Barbary. So around 1900, early 1900, stem rust was causing quite of damage, especially there was a, a famous epidemic in 1916 in uh, North America, uh, motivated both the Canadian and the actually uh, American government to put uh, national programs for Burberry eradication. And what is Burberry is the other uh, uh, rust sometimes need two hosts, two plants to complete their life cycle. Burberry is uh, the shrimp that provided the stem rust the ability to reproduce sexually and when a pathogen reproduces sexually it creates so much uh, different progeny that could have so much different virulences that it's so hard to breed resistance to so much different uh, virulent form so they started scientists realized that early on and they started this uh, with the government, with the public, it was maybe the most excellent example of involving public in eradicating plant disease. So, for example, I have this image where the government, in this case the uh, USDA in USA, sending people this postcard attached to it, sample of the Burberry plant, telling people that if you spot this, destroy it. If you suspect that you saw something similar to that and you are not sure, send back sample. And that people would respond back. This, in this case, the farmer or whoever got that, I have burnt and salted the, that Burberry. In my lab, I was looking the other day in an old box. So this eradication prob programs started around 1918 or 1900s. And uh, I found this sample with the uh, with, uh, stem rust infecting Burberry, and it said Leather Bridge 1950. So I think it took a few years to eradicate the common Burberry. Burberry was used as ornamental shrub, used for uh, making wine or uh, from, ber from its berry jelly, something like that. So now we have the other kind, I guess, of Burberry ornamental that is not uh, is not born to the is different from the common Burberry. So it's not gonna be a threat to wheat. But this is the sample that I found and I found it fascinating. So this is the Burberry with the rust on it. Now uh, this is other thing I was saying that. Uh, they used in the early 1900, there was a lot of the, in, you know, in the experimental farm in Canada, there was a lot of research on both bunt and rust and, and other problems like root, rot diseases and stuff like that. But what I found fascinating actually, that there was, a, they used to spray sulfur with this airplane, never was used on wide scale because it was so costly, but I found this image really really nice image <laughs> so it's a dominion rust lab which was established 1925 in winnipeg to study rust which it was later on the serial research center that is now transferred a couple of years ago closed and uh, moved to to morden so that much of history uh, the other thing i want a little bit to brief touch on, and I think that's important thing I forgot, uh, is the wheat streak mosaic virus disease. So when they say that it's spraying sulfur, would it have been spraying like copper sulfate? Or would it have been... mm, I think they, no, it was sulfur, the, the, it wasn't uh, copper sulfate. So like sulfate or sulf, like elemental sulfate? Yeah, I think sulfate. so, sulfate maybe, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So. But it was m more of research kind of thing. It wasn't uh, much applied because it was so costly, I guess. But uh, what was very effective in controlling rust, especially the stem rust actually, and the leaf rust, is having the national breedings 
program. And uh, actually, since the 50, we don't have much of issue with the stem rust because breeding was very successful and because hopefully eradicating the Burberry was also. So this is a, an image, I like it. I show it to my colleague breeder and I tell them, look how breeder were fashionable. He's sitting in the field with his necktie, hat, and uh, you don't find that anymore. Did the sulfur work though? Was that, that was just I think there was, yeah, it was effective, but uh, costly, right? It wasn't economic uh, to, to use. The other thing I'm going to talk a little bit about is the wheat streak virus because I got so much sample this year of that disease and we sent it to the virology lab and it was confirmed to be the virus. So streak mosaic virus is a, a disease caused on wheat because this uh, streaking like yellow and the green lines. Now this is a bit of old sample but this is basically the symptoms that's why it's called mosaic. Now, other symptoms of that, so this virus is transmitted by a mite called the curl wheat mite, and it's called that way because it caused the leaf to curl. So what you find that the, the leaf curl, something like here, I don't have the symptoms of it, unfortunately, today, but the, the leaf curl forming kind of tubing, and the mite hide there because it liked to, to avoid the sun and the heat. Uh, you cannot see the mite by eye, it's so small. Uh, since the 50, most of the research done on that in Alberta, actually in the 50, this disease was reported in southern Alberta and part of Saskatchewan since that time on. And most of the research done is actually exactly what we know up till today about it. And we use, you cannot control it with chemical. You cannot control virus with chemical anyway. There is no chemical control effective against the mite. Um, we have uh, like uh, some resistance to the mite. We don't have in our lines uh, resistance to the virus. In USA they are working on that. Um, the best advice, now the virus and the mite, both they need the living host to, to survive. So the best advice is uh, to avoid having a green bridge. They can damage wheat, but they can survive on other oat, barley. They don't cause much of damage, but they can survive on volunteer wheat and those things. Avoid having living plant b before you plant your wheat. And, and they are pushing me to finish my talk. I have a lot of photo. I don't like to be pushed, but so I have a lot of photo, you guys. If you like to look around and ask me any question, you are more than welcome. I will be here tomorrow too. Don't post my video on YouTube. <laughs> so. So, like over winter, then is that good enough to have? You know. Over winter, uh, it does over winter. The mite and uh, can resist uh, more freezing temperature than the hardiest winter wheat. But as long as your host, if your host doesn't survive, the virus and the mite cannot survive on a dead tissue. So avoid early planting of your winter wheat because if you plant your winter wheat early on and there is infection, it's gonna establish, might over escape the winter, so uh, like uh, survive the winter early on in the season, the infection. The mite itself doesn't fly, but it's so tricky when it's done feeding, it go climb up to the uh, head of the, like the plant and hang from the tail, waiting for the wind to, so it's kind of wind born actually and establish new infection, cause the stunt of the plant, you will walk in the field, you will feel, you will see, some plants are stunt, molted with the streaking thing, and other plants are healthy, so it's kind of in, in a bucket, spots. Cool. So, streak mosaic virus oh. transmitted by curl, wheat curl mite. Oh, okay. oh, and they come out of the winds from like Washington and stuff too, right? Uh, high down there. Montana has a lot of them. I'm not sure if they survive that long distance in the wind but uh, 
on a sh from field to field they would. Yeah. So if you're growing spring wheat and then you don't have a winter crop, if you have wind, survive through the winter. You know, system? this is interesting. So uh, both winter and spring are susceptible, but with the likelihood of having spring wheat infected is probably less than having the winter wheat infected if you don't have that green bridge. Yeah. So if your neighbor is not growing winter wheat, if your field where you want to grow the spring wheat doesn't have a green uh, other things infected, you will avoid the infection. And when your plant infected at early stage, it's more born to damage than when it is infected later on. So all of these things. So yeah, green bridge, avoid the green bridge. They can't survive on dead tissue. So you push me twice today. <laughs> yeah. Because you won't be on YouTube. I have a photo of your grandfather. Where is it? Is that my grandfather? Your great great grandfather. I'm gonna print it and put your name underneath it. A nice beard. <laughs> yeah. This is the rust god. He's a god. He's a god. People should worship you now, give you red foxes and sheep. Oh yeah. Nice. So yeah. Okay. You're welcome, guys. Thank you. Thank you.